speaking about a man by the name of Horace Greeley. And he was part of a, a worldwide conspiracy to conceal the information that I'm about to speak on today. And there's a definite reason why this information was concealed. Horace Greeley was the editor, was the founder and editor of a paper called the New York Tribune, which, is which was located in New York City. This newspaper was a national newspaper, as well as international, and it had a profound effect on the consciousness of European people. You had many different white organizations at that time. They were all striving for the uplifting of their people, but they had many different ideologies, many different groups of themselves, all striving and vying with each other, sometimes bitter conflict with each other, in order to achieve, achieve that goal, which is the uplift of their people. The, the, the key role that Horst really played was that his paper, his organ, the New York Tribune, was able to gather up all those people and give them a sense of a unified context or paradigm or direction that they was all able to unify themselves behind, regardless to their different ideological differences and so on and so forth. And this is what we're hoping that the Moorish paradigm or the Moorish Renaissance that's taking place now will be able to do. That it will serve as a paradigm that will be able to unify our people in regards to the different ideologies. You know, coming off, they just got themselves together as recently as 1854 to 1865. This is when they finally got themselves together to govern the planet on a global level as recent as that date, and this is around the time of the Civil War, and at the end of the Civil War, they was finally able to put certain things together to bring themselves together. At the time, at Har during Horace, Horace Greeley's time, they was in a similar condition. I come in contact with every aspect of it. Hebrew Israelites, every sect and division of Islam you could think of, uh, na black nationalists, all different types of groups, you know? And it seems like this may be able to unify us behind a certain paradigm. A paradigm is a certain perspective or outlook on the world. Horace Greeley, prior to Horace Greeley's time, the European, or the, what we call the white man, or whatever, he was known as the red man. And they called themselves red men. As a matter of fact, Horace Greeley was a member of a political party, the Red Men's Whigs Party, which eventually he promoted to be changed to the Republican Party. The present-day Republican Party originally was called the Redmond's Whig Party. Horace Greeley, as well as Abraham Lincoln, were members of the, Red, of the Redmond's Whig Party. He suggested to them that they change their names to the Republican Party, and as opposed to calling themselves Redmond, call themselves White Men. And this was to set up this whole dynamic of white being pure and good and white being bad and inferior, this whole white supremacist mentality or paradigm that was being perfected at this time. Now, just to give you an idea of the, of the power and of the influence of Horace Greeley, this was a book taken from a, this was taken from a book called Horace Greeley and the New York Tribune during the Civil War. And it says in the introduction, it says, all contemporaries, friends, and foes of light alike testified that the Tribune exerted the greatest influence upon public opinion of any journal in the country during the period under discussion, which was the Civil War period. It goes on to say that, uh, the paper furnished the basis of a power national in scope and at times enabled the editor to mold public sentiment more effectively than even the president. Harsh Greeley in that, in that paper, the New York Tribune, actually had more influence over the mindset of, of, of European people on an international scale than even the president of the United States. Karl Marx was just the London correspondent of the New York Tribune. This was an international thing that took place here, all right? It also says that it would have been difficult to convince the great mass of rural su subscribers from western New York to Iowa that the old white-coated philosopher, Horace Greeley, did not pen every line in their political Bible. Herein lies the crux of the Tribune power and influence. Horace Greeley was more than, a, than the editor of a great newspaper. He had acquired an enviable reputation as an expounder of political views and had actively sponsored the organization of the Republican Party on a national scale. So Horace Greeley had a great deal of influence. And he was like, more or less, let's say the point man that more or less gathered around him all these different people, go, I mean, covering all different various disciplines, everything from medicine to science to history. 
Just to give you an example, there's an article I have here called Archaeological Cover-Ups. This is an article that was taken from a magazine called Nexus Magazine. This particular article, Archaeological Cover-Ups, was dealing with the Smithsonian Institute, which was founded a little bit prior, or during Harvest Green Times, around, uh, uh, in 1821, excuse me, 1829. And it starts off, it mentions, it says, most of us are familiar with the last scene in the popular Indiana Jones archaeological adventure film, Raiders of the Lost Ark, in which an important historical artifact, the Ark of the Covenant from the temple in Jerusalem, is locked in a crate and put in a giant warehouse, never to be seen again. I'm sure you all remember that part at the end where they shipped it in, they had all these different boxes marked top secret. It goes on to say, the Smithsonian Institute is an independent, independent federal agency. Sounds familiar? IRS, Federal Reserve, so on. An independent federal agency has been actively suppressing some of the most interesting and important archaeological discoveries made in America. Now, what they, what they were covering up was our history in this hemisphere. At this time, this is the time when they concocted, concocted this myth that we were all brought over here on slave ships from Africa to be their slaves. This is one of the biggest lies they ever put together. You're going to see the massive proportions of the lie that they have put forward. Yeah, there were some that were brought here at the, from Africa. But by, 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 by far, the majority of, of us were already here. We had a civilization that went from Alaska all the way down to Chile which they refer to as the ancient mound builders, the one who built the civilizations and built the mounds and pyramids all up and down this hemisphere. And you're going to see further what is the significance and the major role that we play the civilization here in this hemisphere. And the Smithsonian Institute was key in covering up these facts. And then they also mention it here about the Vatican and how they have an underground library in the Vatican. The walls five feet thick and 24-hour security. What they hiding down there? And he mentions how they have things down there that will conflict with the church's credibility or perhaps cast their official text in doubt. So they keep these things hidden. And it says, and it goes on to say, it says, when Thomas, uh, the guy's name is uh, uh, Thomas, he was the director of the Eastern Mound Division of the Smithsonian Institute's Bureau of Ethnology. It says, when Thomas came to the Bureau of Ethnology, he was a pronounced believer in the existence of a race of mound builders distinct from the American Indians. The people who they're saying American with these with the long stringy hair, so on and so forth. He he believed that there was a race of mound builders distinct from the American Indians. However, John Wesley Powell, the director of the, of the director of the Bureau of Ethnology, a very sympathetic, sympathetic man toward the American Indians, had lived with some of these ones who they call Indians. And he felt, he felt sorry for them. He, he felt that, they say he felt sorry for them and they were treated unfairly and that they should get the credit for this. Now remember now, they were in the process of wiping these people out. So it's easy to get credit to a people that you know you're about to wipe out anyway. It goes on and says the Smithsonian began to promote the idea that Native Americans at that time were, at that time being exterminated in the Indian Wars were descended from advanced civilizations and were worthy of respect and protection. They also began a program of suppressing any archaeological evidence that led credence to the school of thought known as diffusionism, a school which believes that throughout history there has been widespread dispersion of, of culture and civilization via contact by ship and major trade routes. Keep that in mind because remember, more means navigator. We were a maritime nation all over the planet. And keep that in mind because we're going to get deeper into that. This is the, the school of thought known as diffusionism believes that throughout history there was a widespread dispersion of culture and civilization via contact by ship and major trade routes. It goes on and says, but the Smithsonian opted for the opposite school known as isolationism. Isolationism holds that most civilizations are isolated from each other and that there has been very little contact between them especially those that are separated by bodies of water. And this intellectual war that started in the 1880s, 1880s, right around Harris Beauty time. Now, this school of thought isolationism gives credence to their whole philosophy of us being so-called third world peoples and them being so-called first world peoples. They're saying 
you, they, this is the first time the world has been unified as what's known as the global villains or unified in economy and trade and so on and so forth. Wrong. There's been two civilizations prior to that in which it was unified by the Moors. First the ancient Moabites or Moabites and then the Moors. It goes on to say, when the contents of many ancient mounds and pyramids of the Midwest were examined, it was shown that the history of the Mississippi River Valleys was that of an ancient and sophisticated culture that had been in contact with Europe and other areas. Not only that, the contents of many mounds revealed burials of huge men, sometimes seven or eight feet tall, in full armor with swords and sometimes huge treasures. All this was being found by the Smiths. Only, this gets back into the Bible where they talk about these different giants and Nephilim and so on and so forth. And it goes on and says, for instance, when Spiro Mound in Oklahoma was excavated in the 1930s, a tall man in full armor was discovered along with a part of thousands of pearls and other artifacts. The largest tre such treasure so far documented. We have many more treasures here. The elders taught us that the Moors did more building underground than we did above ground here. And you see what we did build above ground, or what's left, what the Dominicans and Franciscan priests did not destroy and vandalize and loot and burn and pillage. And, and underground, they are aware of the vast underground tunnel networks that we have built underneath this country, where you was able to travel from New York City to California underground without having come above ground once. And, some, and their military has taken over some of these underground facilities, but they can go over so far deep. And they have, and they know through different infrared and satellite pictures and so on and so forth, they know that there's other things deeper down that they can't get to. And when they came, when the conquistadors came away, they found whole villages and cities empty with people. And they didn't know where they went. Oh yeah. Continuing on, it says, he was told by, uh, he was told by a former employee that the Smithsonian uh, that an uh, employee was dismissed for defending the view of diffusionism. And it said the Smithsonian at one time had actually taken a barge full of unusual artifacts out into the Atlantic Ocean and dumped it into the ocean. This is what they was doing with some of the things that they found. And it mentions here about stone coffins that was discovered in 1892 in Alabama, which were then sent to the Smithsonian Institute and then lost, according to the newsletter. And then going further down, it says, the head curator says, we have not been able to find the specimens in our collections, though records show that they were received. And it says, the Alaskan mound, they found a, a, a mound up in Alaska. And it says, the Alaskan mound was in fact a graveyard of gi gigantic human remains consisting of crania and long leg bones. The crania measured from, from 22 to 24 inches from base wow. to front. Since an adult normally measures about eight inches from back to front, such a large cranium would imply immense size for a normally, a, a, a normally proportioned human. In fact, the habit of flattening the skull of an infant and forcing it to grow in an elongated sca uh, shape was a practice used by ancient Peruvians, Mayans, flatheads, Egyptians. You see some of the different pictures where they have the long head, even in the South. You know, I heard stories where they, had, they used to actually shape the baby's head with their hands. You know, all oh, this is directly related to us. Uh, 